working on our first rooftop vegetable garden located in Boston's Dorchester neighborhood. Uh, I'd met a line cook who was up on the roof for the first day. And one of the first things he said was, these cool plants make cucumbers? <laughs> and you know, it was, it was really interesting to see that he, his only reference point up till now was you know, boxes coming off of trucks or maybe trips to the grocery store but really had never been connected to food, which he worked with every day. So what does it mean when a man of the food industry doesn't know where his food comes from or how it got there? And how did we get to this point? Also, why should you care about the way that our food is being produced? Well, there's a number of reasons. First, obviously, we put food in our bodies. It affects our health. Uh, for richer or poorer, we all need food to survive. Food plays a major role in celebratory, religious, cultural events, parties. And it brings us pleasure. Um, it creates community. It brings us joy. Um, and it has a really important way in the way that we relate to others. People have been eating food for all of time. So what is it about this period of time and American time, and hit really in history, um, that has made us so disconnected from the way that food is produced? Well, one major factor is urbanization. The fact that since World War II, the majority of us are living in cities. By the 1990s, 75% of Americans were living in urban areas. So if you don't ever see a plant grow um, or pick a tomato from a vine or know a farmer, it can be really difficult to understand how that food becomes the object that you put into your mouth. Um, by moving into cities and out of farmland, we inadvertently disconnected ourselves from the food that we're consuming. So how many people in the audience know what a Brussels sprout plant looks like? I'm gonna, oh my, oh, a lot. This is Somerville, so yeah, yeah it is Somerville. people. <laughs> um, for you, for those of you who don't, or maybe you think you do, but this is what a Brussels sprout plant looks like. Um, it's surprising and bizarre. You know, it's really a problem how disconnected we become from the actual plants that are growing the food that we're producing to the items that are going into your mouth. And with that lack of connection of food, a local chef, Marco Suarez, contacted my company in 2010 looking to learn more about food production and produce his own food. Uh, as part of a signing agreement with his restaurant owners, he convinced them to fund an on-site farming operation. Um, so he was working within the confines of a dense, dense city. So there's actually um, a lot of available space where you can put garden beds and do food production that you wouldn't think about. You can put them on backyards. Um, you can use raised beds if there's lead in the soil. Um, you can place them on concrete or on grass. You can put garden beds on schoolyards. You can put them on the lawn of your business. Um, there's a lot of grass that's not being used for any sort of function where gardens could go. You can put them in a deserted lot. Uh, this is in Somerville. It's a project with Groundwork Somerville. We're making a small urban farm around the corner in Union Square. <laughs> so growing plants on roofs is generally referred to as a green roof. Uh, it's been around for centuries and in the last few decades has really become more dominant in Germany and much of Europe and more recently in the US. But growing food on a roof is a wholly American innovation and has really just come around in the last few years. Um, Marco was vaguely familiar with the idea of rooftop food production, having learned about it from some friends in New York, but came to us looking uh, for how to implement it on his roof. So rooftops are actually a really ideal location for agriculture. Um, there aren't a lot of competing uses for rooftop space, and there's actually a huge networks of available rooftops all over the city. Uh, green roofs consist of a number of layers of protection, drainage, and soil that support plants. They help a building uh, stay cooler in the summer, warmer in the winter. They also reduce the amount of stormwater running off into our sewers and out into our waterways. But Marco came to me looking to learn how he could utilize his 4,500 square foot roof to grow a sizable amount of produce that would actually have an impact on their restaurants you know, ordering from trucks. Um, our company was well versed in how to design and build that roof, but we knew we weren't capable of handling the, the farming and the knowledge that goes into farming a large scale operation like this. 
So um, through a mutual friend, uh, Brendan found out that there actually happened to be a business located also in Union Square in Somerville that was doing urban farming, uh, which is my business. Um, Brendan and Brendan's business partner, Mark, uh, myself and my operations director, Anne, all sat down over drinks and they kind of put the idea of us farming this rooftop project in front of us. Um, I don't know if it was the amount of beers we had had or um, just kind of deciding that, you know what, this just seemed like it could really work out. But we agreed. Um, we neither par party had done anything like this. And there aren't a lot of examples of this going on in the area, but we, we went for it. We actually had to take into consideration um, the menu, uh, what a weekly maintenance plan was gonna look like, and so we sat down thinking about what the restaurant was gonna use and came up with a plan to move forward. So with that plan in place, we set about building what we call food roof. The first step is identifying the load capacity of the roof. How much weight can that roof hold? Uh, in New England, we also have to account for snow load which is a pretty significant factor in some winters, unfortunately not this winter. Uh, next step is making sure the roof doesn't leak. And in this case, fixing the dozen or so leaks we found on the roof, because you obviously want to start with a dry building. Uh, and then looking at areas of the roof that could be used for planting and which areas can't be. Roofs are home to much mechanical equipment from telecom to HVAC systems, we want to set back our garden space from that equipment to allow for access by maintenance guys and not impede the function of that equipment. Um, when we're ready for building, first step is a root barrier, which is going to protect the waterproofing from aggressive roots, then a series of protection and drainage layers that are going to ensure the roof is going to shed the water when we get these weird storms of two inches of rain in 20 minutes, we need to make sure the roof is actually going to be able to shed that additional water weight. Uh, with that in place, we separated the planted areas from the non-planted areas with a black locust plank board. Now, black locust is a really dense uh, wood that doesn't require any kind of chemical treatment to prevent rotting. We were able to find a little mill out in the Berkshires where we could get this wood, and we had talked with this lovable but slightly crazy guy named Blue Sky and his wife Joyous Rose and we've been planning this for weeks <laughs> sourcing this wood from them uh, but in the days leading up to the pickup they weren't answering their phones and we had a you know this was a very important piece in the <laughs> construction puzzle uh, we had a crane scheduled and permitted and this isn't the kind of thing you can just just say we need a couple more days but not answering their phones despite that we my partner Mark drives out there. Uh, the mill isn't running, it's in pieces. <laughs> and they, with a smile, say, oh, don't worry about it. They're banging away. And they did get it running. We were able to get the wood, thank God. And we're able to uh, continue on with the construction process and prepare for craning dirt to the roof. So we didn't just use any dirt. We use a dirt called Roof Light, which is an engineered blend which has very particular drainage and lightweight properties. And we put about six to ten inches of dirt all over this roof, depending on the load parameters of different areas of the roof. Also, each one of those bags weighs one ton, just to give you an idea. With uh, beds in place, we surrounded them with a recycled rubber mulch, which is similar to what you see in playgrounds. And that mulch is going to protect the roof from foot traffic, sun exposure, and the last step was putting in a drip irrigation system that's going to ensure plants have plenty of water, but not waste any kind of excessive amount of water. So in the end, what we ended up with is this, a 1,500 square foot rooftop food roof um, for the restaurant ledge. Thank it's, you. <laughs> obviously very, it's dramatically different from what it was, you know, just a couple days before, just a black barren roof. Yeah. So um, it was great and all, and we were really excited that we had accomplished this, um, but there were a number of challenges um, from the point where we had to take over doing the farming. Um, one of the major differences of working on this kind of rooftop medium is that these green roofing soil mixes are meant for drainage. Um, they're meant so that the water isn't going to retain on the roof because you don't want to have any sort of, um, you know, I mean, weight capacity or the water carrying, you know, just staying on the roof. 
Um, so vegetables need a certain level of water retention, and so irrigating the site was really, really difficult. Um, we really struggled with that, and um, the first part of our first year, we had a lot of crops that weren't very successful. Um, not to mention also the green roofing mediums are meant for sedums and grasses, and so we actually have to add a lot of compost as well. So we were kind of figuring out what we needed to be adding to this to make sure it was working for vegetable production, which it typically isn't used for. Um, our first year, we completely overwatered. I mean, we were drowning the root systems of the plants, and it wasn't very successful in that way. Uh, we had a lot of things not take, um, and we didn't really feel like it was doing as well as it could, but we learned from our mistakes and figured out a really good irrigation system that we then adjusted and kind of worked from there. Um, we ended up with a really good year, our second year, after making those adjustments. Another major challenge is actually figuring out what to plant for the restaurant. Um, you have to take into consideration not only what their usage is, so the volume of these plants that they're actually going to be using in the restaurant, but also potentially what they're getting from suppliers, um, trying to offer them specialty varieties that aren't readily available. So the way that we approached this in the first year is we just went crazy. We planted absolutely everything we could think of. Uh, we thought that if we just tried it out, we could see what worked, um, and we could also see what the restaurant was using and, and then adjust it from there. So some examples of the things that we planted on the roof, we planted some basil. Tomatoes. Eggplants. All kinds of greens. Hot peppers, tons of different varieties of hot peppers. Kale. Cucumbers. Fennel exorbitant amount of different varieties of herbs, thinking that the restaurants aren't going to be using a ton of herbs and that we could potentially offer enough herb production that they wouldn't have to be purchasing those from another vendor. And a lot of the crops we were, we were producing were crops that either were very high value or that they couldn't even get from a lot of vendors. So another issue that we came across, this is actually not a huge issue at Ledge because the neighborhood in Dorchester where it is has a lot of um, just forest and, and some kind of landscape, but pollinators is a big issue when you think about working on a rooftop. Uh, if you're in a really isolated and urban environment, often the bees or insects that are moving pollen from male to female parts of the plant and actually creating the fruit that you're eating aren't able to get there. Uh, so there's a couple of ways to work with this, but it is something that came up that we didn't realize was going to be an issue until we started working in these isolated urban environments. Uh, you can actually hand pollinate the plants. Um, it's an interesting and kind of uncomfortable thing to teach people, but you can. Um, or, the birds and the bees. <laughs> or you can actually install beehives, um, and that's a whole other part of urban agriculture is um, urban beehive installations and getting people re-acclimated to having those insects around us. So that's something that you know we didn't think was going to come up, which it did. So. Another challenge is you can't drive stakes into the ground on a roof like this or you're going to cause issues. My first year I built a trellising system for tomatoes and definitely underestimated the weight of a row of 30 tomato plants. But in year two, Green City Growers lead farmer Jason devised a really effective and inexpensive trellising system and just kind of reminded me of the, the need to the collaborative nature of projects like this, that taking people from many different skill sets to really make a successful project. So another thing um, about working on such an open space is the elements and extreme weather conditions. Uh, the first year in 2010 when we were doing this rooftop, uh, there was a little hurricane called Hurricane Irene uh, that came through. It didn't really hit us as hard as it hit most of Western Massachusetts, but when we heard that there was a hurricane on the way, we freaked out about it. Um, we actually went to Ledge, um, Anne and our horticultural director at the time, Ben, went to Ledge and covered up all the plants with plastic tarps and landscaping fabric because those crops are, are valuable. I mean, that's, that's money and that's what we're selling to the restaurant below in doing the maintenance for them. And if you lose your entire crop, you lose your entire season. This stuff's not replaceable. Um, this is something that is just an issue. I mean, it's something that's a major, major issue with farming. Um, you can't really predict the weather, and extreme weather conditions just happen all the time. And it's something where our, our only way to kind of work with this is to just make sure that the restaurant or the client just knows that you can't change or predict the weather and just have an open understanding about what that means and that this is a big part of agriculture. Getting the restaurant staff to use the produce effectively was also a challenge. They're used to ordering this food 
and it's delivered the next day and trying to schedule their menu around what's going to be coming up in a week or two is definitely a challenge. Yeah, not to mention there's, you know, you spend a lot of time training these line cooks to know how to harvest and to use the produce, and there's a really high turnover in the restaurant industry. And so we spend a lot of time trying to educate people and then finding that they weren't there the next week, um, which is a big issue. Um, there's no, we really haven't figured this one out yet, honestly. Um, we're working on it. Um, and I think that the key to it is education. So we're trying as hard as we can to make sure when we're working with a restaurant and there's a farm on the roof, that everyone downstairs understands what's going up on, on the rooftop and really figuring out ways to engage them in the process. We're really looking forward to this upcoming year. Uh, it's gonna be the third planting season coming up. And while this is our personal experience with rooftop agriculture, there's a number of other really cool projects going on in this area as well as beyond in, in the region. So um, there's a really cool project going on right now downtown. Um, Be Good Restaurant has a kiddie pool rooftop farm that we help them maintain. It's on the roof of a parking garage on Washington Street. This past year, we grew 650 pounds of tomatoes from 20 kiddie pools. It's, thanks. It's about the size of four parking spots. In New York, there's the world's largest rooftop farm called the Brooklyn Grange. It's amazing. Uh, in Brooklyn, there's a place called Eagle Street Rooftop Farm that's really focusing on education of the local community as to what food production means. Yeah, and then we also have um, a organization in the area called Higher Ground Farm. They're currently seeking out a 25 to 50,000 foot rooftop space. They don't have it yet. When they do get it, it's going to be a huge move forward for urban agriculture in the area. Uh, Ledge has definitely been the most exciting project, I think, for both companies for us. And it's really important to us because we believe engagement in food production has a real impact on food decisions. And people who are more aware of what their, where their food's coming from are going to be more aware of what they're putting in their bodies. You know, kids who grow up engaging in food production also will have a better understanding as they grow into adults, which is something that passes through generations. And this kind of hyper-local food production is creating jobs for the community, which is another important benefit. Yeah, so companies like mine and Brendan's are really, really excited to be doing this. And we look for as much support as we can from municipalities and organizations and businesses and people who have property in the area. Um, we envision a city that's blanketed in food uh, and a new generation of young farmers who are putting down their roots in the city and sinking their hands into the dirt. Thank you. Thank you.